As the life of Joseph unfolds, we see a story of humiliation and suffering rewritten into a story of redemption and honor. Joseph faithfully walked near God through 13 challenging years of betrayal and abandonment. While God did not waste that pain, he was preparing Joseph to fulfill a greater purpose that was now beginning to unfold. And we saw everything suddenly change for Joseph. And in a moment, he was elevated from the pit to the palace. He interpreted Pharaoh's two troubling dreams, that the land was going to see seven years of absolute abundance, followed by seven years of extreme famine. Because Joseph was the only person able to bring peace to the Pharaoh, he was chosen to lead Egypt during this time. And because Joseph brought the undeniable presence of God to the Pharaoh, he was given incredible power in an instant. God's long-held promises for Joseph are finally coming to fruition. However, there is another story that needs to be rewritten. After 22 years, Joseph's brothers have also suffered trying to banish their betrayal from their minds. They need healing. Jacob needs healing. This family needs healing. And through this famine, their lives are about to change. God's not done writing the story. Let us continue. Amen. Thank you very much, Minsu, for catching us up in our study of Joseph. Uh, happy Mother's Day again. Thank you, moms, for all you do, all the work all the effort that you do. Thank you for showing us Jesus and being pictures of the image of God uh, in our life, and may you feel blessed today. Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story uh, almost 200 years ago, and it's a story called The Telltale Heart, and it's about a man who suffers really a soul sickness. His soul's not well. And the story is about a narrator who invites a gentleman to come and live with him, an older gentleman who he describes as having this pale, white, vulture-like eye that just stares him down. And after a while, the narrator can't take being looked at by that. And so he decides that he's going to get rid of his roommate, and he stealthily steals into his bedroom late at night and eventually smothers him to death. He dismembers the body and places all of the limbs under the floorboards of the house. He cleans up everything. There doesn't seem to be any sign that a murder took place, and he tries to pretend that his soul is well, that it's okay, because that's what we do. We try to make sure we feel good. But what he doesn't know is that his neighbors have heard screams in the middle of the night when the gentleman was being suffocated, and they send the police to the house. And the police knock on the door. The narrator invites them in. They check around. He says, oh, no, those screams, well, that was me. I had a bad nightmare and woke up screaming. And the gentleman, well, he's gone away to visit family. He's not here. And he pulls up some chairs almost over the spot where he's buried the old gentleman. And he seems so at peace, he's sure, convinced that the police would never suspect anything. But as they are talking, all of a sudden he hears a noise, almost like coming under the floorboards. And the noise gets louder. It's a beating. It's a sound of a heart. It's thumping, and it's growing. And finally, all he can hear is this sound, and all he can think about is this dead man. And he's convinced that the police officers must be able to hear this sound too. And so he finally confesses that he did get rid of his roommate because his conscience was awakened. His soul was not well. And let me ask you, how is your soul? How's your soul 
today. The soul, it's kind of that invisible part of us. It's a combination of the spirit that we connect with God, but, but also our mind, our intellect, our will, the part that we cannot see. It's the part of us that was made to reflect God and relate to God and connect with God and to feel God. How's your soul? Just think about that. See, the problem is we think we can go through life and we can let all the stresses and disappointments and tragedies and difficulties and all the hurts and all the challenges, we think that we can go through life and experience those, but they don't affect us. But they do. They eat away at our soul. And sometimes we wonder, why is it we don't really feel like worship or why God seems so far away or why it's difficult to pray or why God's word just seems like background noise? How is your soul? Maybe moms on this day, how's your soul? How do the challenges and the joys of motherhood affect your soul? Maybe sons and daughters, how is your soul? How's that relationship with your mom speak to you? And what we want to see today is that God is deeply concerned about our soul. We're concerned about our physical health. We spend a lot of time on our physical health. We're concerned about our mental health, and we spend a lot of time on that. Those are great things, but what about your soul? And we've seen over these last five weeks or so how God has worked with this man by the name of Joseph who is betrayed by his brothers because he had some great dreams of greatness that his family was going to bow down before him. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, eventually falsely accused, put into prison, left and forgotten. And yet all throughout all those experiences, his soul rested in God. And then God elevated Joseph. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream. He becomes second in command. And God is at work in Joseph's soul. But as Mitsu said, there's a whole other family. There's these brothers that sold Joseph into slavery. His dad, who thinks that Joseph is dead, and God wants to do a work in their soul. God cares about your soul. He cares about your soul he cares about the souls of people you've hurt. He cares about the souls of people who have hurt you. And he wants to be at work in their life. And so we're going to see today that the beginning of what's going to be a three or four week journey for us of how God restores the rest of Joseph's family and what God does. We're going to see three things that God brings into our life to help heal our soul because God's going to rewrite a story of a sick, unhealthy soul. He's going to rewrite it into spiritual wholeness. For these brothers. So I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 42 as we continue our story. We left at the end of 41. Joseph interprets this dream. There's going to be seven years of famine that, or seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. It's probably now in year two or three of that seven years of famine. Joseph is distributing food in Egypt because he stored it up and now we move from Egypt back to Canaan. And in verse 1 of chapter 42, it says, When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some food for us so that we could live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin Joseph's brother with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. 
So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where did you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. So Joseph is now probably 40 plus. It's been um, over 20 years since he was sold into slavery. His brothers seemingly have moved on with life. They committed their crime. They lied to their dad that Joseph must have been eaten by a wild animal. And they just went on. They thought they went on, but their souls were still sick. And what we see is that God is going to use pressure, first of all, to heal our souls. Because all of a sudden, there's this pressure that they experience because they're experiencing the same famine that's been in Egypt. And the same famine that helped to elevate Joseph to a position of authority is the same famine that God's going to use to heal these brothers. And what you notice is the soul sickness of Jacob, the dad, and the soul sickness of the brothers. Jacob says to the brothers, hey, we're out of food. Like, we're going to die. Mother Hubbard's cupboard is bare. Can you go get some food for us? And so he sends 10 of the sons there, but one, Benjamin, the youngest, he keeps back. He holds him. He's like, I can't afford to lose him. I've lost his full brother. I can't afford to lose it. He's all I got. Here is Jacob, same problem, same problems of favoritism and passivity that have always been part of his life. And he sends the other two brothers. And his soul sickness is fear. For over 20 years, he's let fear rob his soul of peace with God. And you know that you have a soul sickness when you are still doing things because something in the past affected you. That some hurt, some pain, some sorrow, some tragedy, it still reverberates decades later in your life and imprisons you in fear. And this is Jacob. And God's going to do a work in Jacob's life and heal him of his fear, but it's going to be a tough go. And then we see the soul sickness of these 10 brothers because they're running out of food. There's not going to be enough for them. Jacob says, we're about to die. And what are these brothers doing? Nothing. No doubt, they too know that there is some food to be had in Egypt. They could easily have said to their dad, hey, let's go to Egypt and see if we can't get food. But they don't do that. Why? Because Egypt's their greatest fear. Just the word Egypt strikes fear in their heart because they knew that's where they sold Joseph. And I can imagine them saying to each other, we can't go to Egypt. What if we run into him? There's at this time between two and five million people in Egypt. What are the odds? They're astronomical. That they would run into their brother. And they would rather not face their greatest fear and would rather starve. And what we see is their soul sickness is a conscience that's hardened. And there's no greater danger to our life than a deadened conscience. For 20 plus years, they've hidden what they have done. They've kept it from their dad. And no doubt, they have written a story for themselves that Joseph deserved it. It was okay. They helped their family. Their family's far better without Joseph. They've tried to rewrite the story, but their conscience still feels it. And God was going to take them to Egypt. Have you ever had a time where you've had to go face your greatest fear? Like, you don't want to do that. 
About 15 years ago, I was crossing into the US and was stopped by a border guard. And uh, if you know, I have these slight um, kind, of, kind of basic nerve tremors. They're, they're nothing there, but, not, but I have them. And so the border guard saw them and he's like, oh, well, he must be hiding something. He's extra nervous. No, I've had these for 40 years. And so he called me in, searched my car, searched me, took everything, trying to find something. After a couple hours, they finally let me go. I was innocent. I hadn't done anything. But it took me three years before I crossed at that border again. I would drive miles around. I'd make my family. Nope, we're not going there. That's the easy place. We're going all the way here because I don't want to have to face that again. And you know your soul is unwell when you can't face something. When a decision you make in the present is based on something that happened long ago. But finally, because of Jacob's pushing, and probably because they were starving, these 10 brothers band together and they go to Egypt. And I bet they feel like a fish out of water. These shepherds who are there, Hebrew long beards, coming with animals, not very welcomed in Egypt because shepherds weren't. And they come to very cosmopolitan Egypt where everybody's dressed up, they've got makeup. And who do they run into? I mean, the odds are extraordinary. But they say, we need to go get food. They say, well, you can get food over here. And who's the one on that day distributing it but their brother, Joseph? Now, he has learned Egyptian by this time. He's speaking through an interpreter. He's all dressed differently. His beard is shaved. Probably has some eye makeup. And they don't recognize him. But they know his position. And so they bow down. And there's Joseph standing before his ten bowing brothers. What's that? That's his dream, a dream from 20 plus years ago. It's finally come to fruition. What God had put in his heart, what had probably kept him sane through all those decades is now finally happening, but it's not full because his dream was what? All his brothers. There's a brother missing. What happened to him? There's a dream of his mom and dad, and they're not there. His mom can't be there, but the stepmoms can. And Joseph understands that God has used a bit of pressure in these brothers' lives to get them to a point where reconciliation can happen. And God has these brothers in the right spot. And when they were out on the sheep fields and everything was good and they're sitting, listening, playing some music, talking to each other, everything was okay. They could hide the true condition of their soul. But what does pressure do? Pressure reveals what needs to happen in our life. Pressure causes us sometimes to to realize that time doesn't change a guilty conscience, that we just can't sweep guilt under the carpet, but that we have to deal with it. See, sometimes when difficult things happen or we got a bit of pressure, what do we do? We think, oh, why is God punishing me? Why is God doing that? Why is God mad at me? Why is he abandoning me? Many times God just wants to heal you. God wants to heal our Conscience, God wants to rewrite our story, that there's something deeply hidden, maybe even from us, that God wants to heal in our life. And maybe you feel that even right now. Maybe you're going like, why is this happening? Why is this pain? Here it was famine. God had taken something from these brothers, had taken food. There was a leanness in them, and God was trying to bring healing. And when we feel pressure, our first response shouldn't be, oh, no, we're being punished. What do I do? Our first response should be, God, what are you trying to heal? Where are you trying to work in our life? 
The second thing that God uses is not only just pressure, but he uses reciprocal treatment. Look what happens to these guys. In verse 9, it says, Then Joseph remembered his dreams about them and said to them, Oh, you're spies. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. No, no, my Lord. They answered, Your servants have come to buy food. We're all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men. We're not spies. No, he said to them, you've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who live in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is, well, one's no more. And Joseph said to him, it's just as I told you, you're spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. And so here's Joseph. He sees like his dream living out before him. His brothers are bound. He's got them in a place where he wants them. And now he's got to decide what to do. Because it would be easy for him to reveal himself. He could have been very nice and say, hey, look, nothing really bad happened. I know it was difficult for me and it was difficult for you, but I'm okay. Look what God did in my life. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to reveal himself too early. Why? Well, because if they said, oh, hey, forgive us, oh, hey, we messed up, if they apologize, what would Joseph not know? He'd not know if they were sincere or if he could trust them. Are they just apologizing because he has the power to give them food? Are they just apologizing because they want to get in on the power and authority of their brother? Are are they just apologizing because they're in a tight spot, or is there going to be ongoing godly sorrow for what they have done. And what about their dad? That was part of the dream. Joseph probably didn't know what had they told Jacob. What does Jacob know? Does he think I'm dead? Does he think I've been sold into slavery? He doesn't know. He doesn't want the brothers to go back and hide that Joseph is in Egypt. He doesn't want them to go back and say, oh, we got our food and everything's okay. And what about Benjamin? His biological brother. Did they treat Benjamin like they treated Joseph? Was Benjamin even still alive? There was a lot to find out. And even if they did apologize, could there be trust? Could a relationship form? Because as we're going to see, forgiveness is very different than the restoration of a relationship. You have to have forgiveness for the restoration of a relationship, but you also need trust. And Joseph is going to do a lot in the next couple of weeks. We're going to look to build trust to see, are these guys trustworthy? And so what Joseph is going to do is he's going to take these brothers through a journey just like his journey. Their journey is going to parallel very much the journey that Joseph took. What's the first thing he does? He accuses them, what, of being spies. He's harsh with them. These brothers were always harsh with Joseph. They called him the dreamer. Joseph one time gave a bad report. They thought, oh, he's spying. Joseph was sent to spy on them again or to check on them. They're like, oh, he's a spy. No, 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 these brothers said, just like Joseph had said, oh, I'm I'm not a dreamer. I'm not that. It's okay. No, no, no. We're not spies. We're all sons of one man. We're the sons of one man. We're honest people. Now, what do you think kept Joseph from laughing hysterically when they said, oh, we're honest. They hadn't been honest a day in their life. One slept with a stepmom. Others said, killed a number of people in a village. They lied for 20 plus years. They've been lying about what happened to Joseph. They've been telling a different story. Oh, we're honest men. No, 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 you're spying. You're come to see where the weakness is in our land because you want to come take our food. 
No, no, no. We're all the sons. We're one. There were 12 of us. 10 are here. Our younger brother is at home. And our other brother is, well, well no longer. I'm sure it made Joseph wonder, what had they said about him? To hear he was no longer. But they changed their story. They were 10 sons. Oh, now there were 12 sons. And all of a sudden, Joseph, he goes, see, I told you you were lying. You can't be honest. You told me one story, there were 10. Now you tell me there were at one time 12. Like, I need to know. I'm not going to give you food or do anything until I know that you're trustworthy. <laughs> so he says, I want you to go and decide which one of you is going to go get your brother, and the others of you are going to be confined here. You're going to be in prison. Stay here. And I bet Joseph just smiled as he watched these 10 brothers trying to figure out which one was going to be free, who was the most trustworthy that would go and get their brother. And they knew that Jacob didn't want Benjamin at all. What if that one brother failed? What if their dad loved Ben more than he loved them and wouldn't send them, and they're going to be in prison forever? What are they going to do? And you see how Joseph is recreating what had happened to him. He came one day. The brothers accused him of being a dreamer. He tried to defend himself. They threw him, what, in a pit, stripped him of a rope, throw him in a pit. Joseph confines these brothers. Where did he confine them, do you think? No doubt he had access to the royal prison. These were people from another country. Wouldn't it be logical he put them in the same prison he had been confined in for years? And what happened to Joseph is happening to them. And God is awakening their soul. There's nothing like some pressure to awaken the soul. There's nothing like reciprocal treatment to awaken their soul. And God is being graceful. When God seems to work hard in our life, it's his grace to give us a healing that we desperately need. And so here they are, three days in prison, trying to figure out which one they're going to let go to get Benjamin and bring him back. Which one do they trust the most? And then we see it continue. It says, on the third day, Joseph said to him, do this and you will live because I fear God. If you really are honest men, then let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you will not die. And this they proceeded to do. And they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but he wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And Reuben replied, well, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you, no, you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. And they did not realize that Joseph could understand them and that he was using an interpreter. And Joseph turned away from them, began to weep, and then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. And so after three days, Joseph seemingly changes his mind. Why? Because the brothers were going to kill Joseph. And then what? They changed their minds and put him in prison. Joseph's recreating everything. And he says, hey, if you really are honest, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Why don't I send nine of you back? One will stay here. You just bring your brother back, and then we'll let him go. And I imagine, like now, which one of the brothers is going to stay? You can imagine the conversation as they're trying to figure out which one, which one's going to stay, which one 
right, draws the short straw. And as they're talking together, notice what happens. Their conscience is awakened. They realized what they are experiencing is happening because of what they did to Joseph. Because something happened. We can treat people one way. We can treat people even not so well. And it doesn't really bother us. We're treated in the same way. And it elucidates all sorts of emotions and feelings. What's happening? And notice what these brothers say. We're being treated this way because of how we treated Joseph. What did we do? He was pleading. He was asking for his life. He was doing what we're doing. And we didn't listen. And you get the sense that the reminders of Joseph screaming in the pit has stayed with these guys for 20 plus years. Their soul is not well. But notice what they do not say. They don't say, oh, well, we got rid of him because he was a dreamer or he was a spy or our father was too passive or our father had a favorite. We had to show him. They don't blame someone else. They're finally, what, taking ownership for what they've done. We did this, and now we're paying the price. We should have listened. And Reuben chimes in, and he said, hey, I told you. Like, I wasn't going to kill him. I was going to spare him. I was going to come back and release him. And friends, this is how we know God is working in our conscience and how forgiveness starts. Because often what happens is that when we apologize to someone or we try to kind of bring reconciliation, we say, well, I'm sorry for doing this, but I wouldn't have done it if you hadn't have done that. Or the reason I act this way, because you did that first. And what we do is we don't apologize. We really give a subtle blame to the other person. These guys are finally, for the first time, taking ownership of what they've done. That's where soul healing, it starts. And Joseph sees this. He sees the brothers, like, coming to terms with who they are. He hears for the first time Reuben's love for Joseph and at least not wanting him killed, but wanting to rescue him and not harm him. He understands things where it always says he seemed. And what does he do? It says he cries. He can't take it anymore. In the next few chapters, we're going to see Joseph weeps seven times. The second in command, the great leader in Egypt, this one everyone looked up to, he weeps seven different times. What makes you weep? What makes you weep? Because what causes us to weep says a lot about us. Says a lot about our character. Says a lot about our what we value. I don't play baseball. I leave that to Pastor Sean. I cry like a baby at every baseball movie. Every movie where there's a guy trying to make it, who works and who's kind of redeemed, who, you know, kind of gets in the major or whatever and falls out or tries to do it, and there's a dad or a mom behind them who's really supportive. Like, I cry like a baby. My family, like, I'm just leaking the whole time because there's something about redemption restoration that speaks to my heart. What makes you weep? Because it tells a lot about what you value. And Joseph says, okay, you pick one. They're going to stay. He has them bound. I mean, it's not just that they have to stay at a hotel in quarantine. He's bound. You guys go. He picks Simeon to stay. Why Simeon? Judah was the oldest son. Judah, we think, probably was away when they sold him into slavery. Simeon was the next oldest and the one responsible for him being in prison or being sold. 
And these brothers experienced this reciprocal relationship. They had sold Joseph. He was bound. He was sent. Joseph now sees the brothers in a difficult position. And there's sometimes we wonder, why has the same thing happened to me? Sometimes it happens again and again because God's trying to teach us a lesson. Sometimes when we treat someone one way, we don't think about the response. And all of a sudden, we're treated that way. God says, hey, I want to awaken your conscience. Sometimes we wonder, why do I keep going through the same thing again and again? It's because God wants us to heal. Came across this quote this week that, that really said it all. It says, perfect repentance comes when we find ourselves in the same situation, but this time you act differently. That's proof of a change in a person's heart. How do you know you've grown? How do you really know you've changed? It's not when you experience the same thing and you keep making the same mistakes. It's when you experience the same thing and, and God's changed you. You're changed. Your soul is healed. And so here we see these brothers. God's awakening their soul through pressure. That God's beginning to bring their conscience to the surface as they take responsibility. And now Joseph is going to use amazing grace and generosity to get them to come and see God. Because notice what Joseph has said to them. He says, I'm going to change my mind because why? I want you, I want to know that I fear God as well. Why does he say that? I'm sure that was a mind bender for these brothers. How could this Egyptian guy fear the same God we do? And Joseph, he wants his brothers, what, to experience the presence of God because what got him through his own soul sickness, it was God. And he knew the only way these brothers could be healed as if they connect with God. And what had the brothers not talked about to Joseph yet? God. There is no mention of God. Mention of the Father. No mention. Like, not like, hey, we're honest guys because we worship God. No. We're just honest guys. And so Joseph, he does something incredible. He gives them amazing grace. It says in verse 25, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provision for their journey. And after this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. And at the place where they stopped for one night, one of them opened a sack and to get feed for his donkey. And he saw his silver in the mouth of the sack. My silver's been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. And their hearts sank. And they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us? And when they came to get to their father and Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that were happened. They said, The man who is lord over the land spoke harshly to us, treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, No, we're honest men. We're not spies. We were 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more. The youngest is now with the father in Canaan. And then the man who is lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know you are not spies but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. And as they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. And when they and their father saw the money packets, they were frightened. And their father Jacob said to them, you've deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. But Reuben said to his father, you may put both of my sons to death if I don't bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care. I will bring him back. But Jacob said, my son won't go down there with you. His brother's dead. He's the only one I have left. If harm comes to him on the journey you're taking, that will only bring gray hair, my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. And so as these guys get ready to go back to Canaan, Joseph secretly loads them up with food. Here, here's some extra provisions that you can take. And he takes their money, their silver, puts it back in the grain sacks. Why? Because they had sold Joseph for silver. He knew they loved money. 
And what would probably happen is they'd have these big bags of grain that they would load on wagons and take back for their animals and everything back in Cana. But they'd have some smaller bags that they would open for their day's journey to get back there. And so one of them opened one of these smaller bags, and there was the money, the money that they were supposed to give to buy the grain. And they freak out. Now, when you go to the grocery store... And maybe you don't ring something up right, or someone gives you the wrong change back, or it, it kind of a few items are missed, and, and you come out a little bit ahead, you've got extra money, what do you usually do? You kind of celebrate, hey. <laughs> and then maybe after a while you go, you know what, that cashier, they're probably going to get in trouble, so I, I'm a good person, I'm going to go and take it back. These brothers... Up until this point, you know these guys. If they got extra money, they would have been, start the donkeys, let's get away from here as fast as we can. Look at what we got. We got a deal. But they didn't. When you get a little extra change from the cashier, do you think, oh, God's punishing me? When someone makes a mistake in your favor, do you go, oh, my goodness, God is just going to rain down his wrath on me? No. But if your conscience is guilty, you do. And here they're like, oh, no, God's punishing us. And notice what they said. This is God. It's the first time they finally connect with God. What gets them to God? It's not Joseph's putting them in prison. It's not his harsh voice. It's his kindness. It's generosity. And that's what Paul says in the book of Romans In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, he said, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, Vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is what Joseph does. He says, I'm going to show them evil. I'm not going to take every bit of vengeance. As we're going to see next week, he tries to build trust, but he pours out mercy. And it's in that mercy that their eyes are finally turned to God. Friends, Paul in Romans 3 says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not God's punishment. It's God's kindness. And Sometimes we wonder, why is God putting pressure on us? because he wants to heal our soul. Why are we going through the same thing again and again? Because God wants us to know we're changed. And why does God seem incredibly caught? Why do these wonderful things happen? It's because God's leading us near to him. God's using that to shape our soul. And probably the greatest soul sickness we have is being sinful people separated from God. The greatest soul sickness we have is that our hearts are hard against God because we're selfish and prideful and it's about us and we've forgotten God and our hearts are just hard. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and lavished his love upon us, sacrificed, gave us everything He gave his life on the cross. He rose again to give us life. He did that to heal our souls, to bring us soul health. And when you came in, you received a a, a cup and was a a wafer and some juice. And in a moment, we're going to share communion. The worship team is going to come back. and We're going to sing about the resurrecting power. But sometimes we think, oh, why is is God's punishment and hurt? That awakens our soul. It's God's kindness that heals our soul. Let's pray together. How is your soul? And when we're going through difficulty or pressure or the same thing, or even when God's been incredibly gracious, what a question to ask us and to ask others. What's God doing? What's God doing in your soul now? And Lord, thank you that you care about our soul. 
care about our physical being, our mental being. You care about our soul, Jesus. Jesus, would you bring a healing to our soul? We pray for those who are going under a lot of pressure. Maybe it seems like a famine that you've taken something from their life. Lord Jesus, would you be kind and gentle and yet firm and in that firmness? Would they release something to you? Lord, when we feel like we're going through the same thing again, and for those of us who are like, why is this happening to me again? Lord, would you show us the progress we're making? Would you do it one more time in our life if it meant that it showed we're healed? And Lord, we take the extravagant love and grace of Jesus. And would it always point us to you? I invite us to stand as we worship the resurrected King Jesus. Hey everyone, my name is Sawyer. I'm so glad that you joined us today. If you were impacted by this message and you have a desire to dive deeper into a church community, I would encourage you to join us in person for our full Sunday experience. We'd love to meet you at our Welcome Center and get to know who you are. And here at Bayview, our desire is for everyone, everywhere, to experience God's love. So whether you are a lifelong believer or you're kind of going through a season of doubts and questioning or you're simply curious about church, you are welcome and you are loved here. Also be sure to check out our website, bayviewglen.org, for our service times and any midweek events to join. So come be part of our community here at Bayview Glen Church. Can't wait to see you.